So we'd uh, left off last time. I put up this uh, expression here. This is where we started with it. And this is, uh, this is the end of last time's lecture. And it was certainly not a midterm expression, not something we could put directly into a uh, Carnot map. I mean, we could tackle it with Boolean algebra, but that doesn't sound like uh, much fun. So I think our plan was to use enough Boolean algebra on it to turn it into a midterm expression, and then once we get it into a midterm expression, put it on the Carnot map. Uh, I think I had neglected to show you when we were talking about Boolean algebra to show you De Morgan's theorems. Uh, so I put those up there because if we looked at this, this term here was uh, definitely something we needed De Morgan's theorem with. And if you want to think about how De Morgan's theorem works, it's the difference between in putting the inverts on the input of a chip versus the output of a chip. It makes a big difference. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. So if we started with this expression, I just factored essentially this not B through there and came up with that. And then I used De Morgan's theorem on this, where if I inverted A or B, I got the inverse of, I got the, uh, uh, not A and not B, and then I just uh, simply repeated that term there. Then I, uh, uh, in, in essence, factored that C not D through there and came up with that, and that was a uh, midterm expression, and I think I can go to a Carnot map on that, right? So let's do that. I'll draw the Carnot maps exactly like I've always done in the past, and I would encourage you to keep track of that order. Maybe we'll make some Carnot paper. So we had uh, not A, not B, not A, B, A, B, and A, not B. And we had not C, not D, not C, D, C, D, and C, not D. So if we uh, start through these things, um, the first two terms are probably going to be more difficult. I'll just go ahead and tackle it in order. If I have a CD and anywhere that I have a not B, it looks like I would have a 1 there. And then again, CD in any place that I have a not B, that would give me a 1 down there. As I then uh, move to the next term, anywhere that I have a not B and a not C. So a not B and a not C would give me a 1 there and a 1 there. Let's see, a not B and a not C give me a 1 there and a 1 there. Then uh, this will just give me one, so not A, not B, first row, C, not D, fourth column. And lastly, this will also just give one A, B, so third row, C, not D, fourth column. Okay, so how can we do this thing? Well, remember that the uh, Carnot map is essentially a Carnot globe. You think about it wrapping around something that is uh, round. And we're looking for not multiples of two, but uh, powers of two. So we're looking for twos, fours, and eights. So we could really look at something like that. Wouldn't that work? That would get us a uh, four. Then I could, if I wanted to pick up something like that, that would give us another four, because overlapping is not a problem. And speaking of overlapping is not a problem, rather than just circling this one, what could I do? I could actually get a four out of that thing, couldn't I? Okay. And finally, this one, we can't go diagonal, so what's the best we can do with this one? Just a single circle around it, and we'll get it right back out of there. Okay. So when we do that, the uh, output on this thing is going to end up this uh, first one here. I could put a little one here indicating a fir the first one we're looking at. What does that tell us? That... Uh, D doesn't matter, so I have a not C, right? And then what am I looking at here? A doesn't matter, so a not B, not C, or if I then look at this one, I'll put a little 2 there. Looking at that one, what am I going to get? Again, a not B, and what will I have? Uh, D, right? Or, if I look at this one, I'll call that one 3. What's that telling me? 
just uh, A, B, not A and not B, right? Or the fourth one then, what I'm going to have with a fourth one. I just repeat the term A, B, C, not D, right? So that would be your output. So we want to hang on to the Boolean algebra, even if we like Carnot mapping, you may have to uh, use a little Boolean algebra to get it reduced uh, so that you can put it on the Carnot map. I got a, a couple more Carnot maps that I want to do to illustrate a couple more points, and then we will uh, call it good on the Carnot maps. And I guess that, that comes good. That uh, is a good thing to kind of review and start the day with. Questions on that particular one? Well, let's try a couple more then. So let's say that we have uh, page two. Let me try this. Say that we are given not A, not D. Not A, not D. Or A and uh, not B and not D. Or not A and not C and a D. Or not A and C and D. So let's see if we can simplify that. Can I go to my Carnot map? And we've mainly done four input Carnot maps. We talked a little bit about two input and three input. But I guess we did a couple three inputs uh, last time. You can do multiple inputs and, and Shams outlines talks about how to do that. It, you're essentially going to start to with more than four is lay the Carnot maps one on top of the other and look in the uh, third third dimension, if you will. Um, we won't be doing that in here. Okay, again, I kept the uh, same order there. So the first term, not A, not D. I'm going to pick up a uh, 1 here. Should pick up a one there, and a one here, and a one there, right? Then the next one, A not B. So I'm going to be down here, and anywhere that I have a not D, so I'll pick up those terms. Then the third one, not A. So anywhere that I have a not A, and I need a not C and D. So not C and D with a not A, it gives me a one not C and D with a not A. Gives me another one there, doesn't it? Yeah. And then I have a CD with a not A that will give me two more right there. Okay. So what can we do with that one? Yeah, you could get eight out of this pretty easy, right? We don't get to do eight very often, so we should enjoy that. So there's an eight. What else? Yeah, I heard two twos, but we can actually do a little better than that. We can get the, uh, we should be able to get the four corners, which gives us a four. Okay. So with that, we can get a significant uh, simplification. We will have, what does this uh, first one tell us? This great big one of eight. That's uh, certainly C and D don't matter, and B doesn't matter. So I have, as you said, A naught. Thank you. That's correct. Or then I look at the four corners. What does the four corners tell me? B naught and D naught. Okay. So a huge simplification there. Certainly worth our while. Questions on that one? Well, let's go to one more that I'll present a uh, issue that. Uh, Maybe hasn't come up. It's not a big deal, but just uh, so you can hap uh, handle if it happens. So our output again, not A and uh, not B and not D, or A and not C and not D, or not A and B and not C, or A and B and not C and D, or... A and not B 
and uh, C and not D. Okay, so we'll put that into a, a Carnot map, our last Carnot map. Try not to uh, get too teary eyed. I guess it might be won't near our last Carnot map, but our last Carnot map for just the sake of Carnot maps. Okay, so if I look at the uh, first term, not A, not B, so I'm going to be in the first row and then not C, so I pick up a 1 and a 1 there. Then the next term, not C, not D, so I'm going to be in this first column and anywhere that I have an A, so I'll pick up a couple more 1s there. Then with this, not A, B, not A, B, so second row. Anywhere that I have a not C, there's a not C, there's a not C. Then that should only give us one, uh, one, one. So I've got A, B, and not C, D. There we go. And one more here. A, not B, right here. C, not D. Okay. So how shall I do this? Yeah, I can pick up the four corners for sure. Okay. The bottom, this one, yeah. right there. Uh, let's see. I think that came from. Yeah. Yeah. A not B. So, yeah, A not B, yeah, so that one there. No, that's not right. Where did I, this one here, where did I get that one? From the, from the second term. Second term, so I had, uh, oh, yeah, anywhere that I had an A, right? Yeah. So I knew I was going to be in this column, and then anywhere that I had an A. So I picked up this one, and I picked up uh, this one here. Okay, good question. What else should I do? How about a four? Was that the four you were thinking of? Okay, what about this one? That's what we call redundant, okay? Yeah, we're not picking up anything. If there was a one hanging out there and we could do that, we would do it. We have not uh, added anything with that, so don't do that. Redundant. Don't. Okay. So we'll just look at the uh, the two circles. So the uh, corner then gives us B naught, D naught, or then this one gives us what? B, C naught. Good. So again, a major simplification there. Well, let's uh, look at the. I've got a lot of practice and uh, a lot of. Uh, scenarios that come up, so we should be pretty good with Carnot maps. Let's see where we might put these into uh, play, or how they might fit into uh, doing something besides just having fun with Carnot maps. So let's say that uh, we have a chemical plant, or maybe just a chemical tank, and it's uh, fitted with uh, four high-low sensors on it. We're going to talk a little bit before we're done about how we could make those sensors and what those might look like. A lot of you may go into instrumentation. That's certainly a big area. So let's we'll start our little conversation on that. But for now, uh, we've got four high-low on-off switches that are monitoring the temperature. We'll call T. The pressure we will call P. The fluid level that we will call L, and the weight W. And you might say, uh, you know, why are we looking at both both fluid level and weight? Well, maybe we have a whole bunch of sludge forming in the bottom of the tank or something. So the uh, the, the fluid level might be normal, but the weight would be uh, high because you got that, that sludge at the bottom. I, I don't know. 
that, that might be one possibility. I'm, I'm not going to try and read too much into it, but uh, that gives us uh, four variables. And we'd like to design a system that will activate when the following takes place. These are troubled conditions. So the uh, first one is a high fluid level. A high fluid level with high temperature and high pressure. Okay, high fluid level, high temperature, high pressure, doesn't sound good at all. We want to uh, turn on an alarm, maybe turn on uh, some pump or something to try and rectify this. The other one, that, uh, two, three more that we won't like is a low fluid level. A low fluid level with a high temp. and a high weight. Okay, we've got a bunch of sludge there with not much fluid on it, just cooking off. Uh, third one, a low fluid level with a low temp and a high pressure. And finally, a low fluid level with a uh, low weight and a high temperature. So these are the scenarios that we are concerned with and want to at least uh, turn on a light or an alarm or maybe even we'll talk about how could we uh, even have this turn on uh, some sort of a pump or something maybe to try and fix the situation. So um, what is our, we've got temperature is T, we've got pressure is P, fluid level is L, and weight is W. So if I want to come up with these terms that I could put in a min-term expression, what is this? A high fluid level, that would be L. A high temperature, that would be T, and a high pressure, that would be P. Then uh, this one, what would this be? A low fluid level, so not L, that would be taken as a zero, so not L if I'm looking at the midterm expression, with a uh, high temperature, so T, and a high weight, W. Here, what do we have? A low fluid level, so again, not L. A low temperature, not T and a high pressure, so we've got P. And finally, with this one, a low fluid level, so not L, and a low weight, not W, and a high temperature, T. So I'll put this in here and we'll say that the output, or why don't we just say alarm, writing the midterm expression, uh, just oring those together, I'm going to have L and T and P, or not L, and T, and W, or not L, and not T, and P, or L, or I should say not L, and not W, and T. Okay. So, I'd like to do a Carnot map on this. I think I have room for this. Let's see if I can fit this in here. So I'm going to group up uh, temperature and pressure. And you might say, well, how would you know to do that? That's not the critical point here. The critical point would be the uh, the knots. So again, like I've always done, both those would be uh, inverted, this is inverted, and then that's inverted. And then I'm going to follow that here, so I'll have uh, level and weight, and I will keep the same inverting sequence that we've always done with the Carnot maps. Okay. So you could switch up your uh, uh, T's and L's, but as long as you keep the, uh, the knot structure, you should be good. So where are we going to be? This first one, 
Let's see, L and T and P. So there's T and P when I have an L. So I end up here and here. Then the next one. I've got uh, any place that I have a T and a W and a not L. So it'd be the last two rows and a not L and a W. Not L and W. So I'm going to be here and here. Is that right? Not L and W. Yes. Okay. Then this one. I'm going to have a not L and a uh, not T and a P. So right here and right there. And then lastly, a not L and a not W. So I'm going to be in this first column here. And any place that I have a T, that would be there and there, wouldn't it? Okay. So what's a good way to do that? Again, we don't want to circle a 6. I think last time I talked about multiples, that would be wrong. We want powers. So we've got uh, twos and uh, fours and eights. So there's a four. I guess that would also include ones. We got another four here, is that right? Okay. What else? And then that long four. Okay. So we could simplify this and say that our alarm would then be what? What did I learn with this long one? It's just uh, temperature and pressure, right? Or this one up here, what do I get? It looks like uh, P, not L. Or what did I learn with this one? T and not L. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, okay. So this this one here that I so you were asking why would I would want to circle four of those rather than just doing two? Okay. So if I just did the two, this term would come up rather than uh, uh, TP. It would come up what? TP, and then I would have uh, L, right? So it wouldn't be as simple as it could be. Uh, well, they would be included with these. Yeah. It just wouldn't be as simple. Yes? Would you be getting a difference if you had different variable partners? So say L and T and W? No, you shouldn't as long as you keep the, uh, the, the order of the knots the same. Well, let's uh, put this together then. I guess this is uh, page four. We go on to page five. So, uh, looking at this thing, we want to uh, build this. So, what are we going to have? We need uh, some three input or uh, two input and gates. And then these are going to go into a three input OR gate. And what do I have? With the uh, first one, I could say that I have a pressure. That'll just go in there. And I would also have temperature. That will go in there. The next one, I have pressure and level. So let's see, we'll put level. And we need an inverter, right? And then I need pressure coming off of there. And lastly, I need temperature. 
and not level. Something like that. Okay. So that's what I'd have. Which is quite a bit easier than the expression that we started with. I mean, if we were looking at this, we would have what? One, two, three, four. We'd have to have four, three input AND gates and a four input OR gate or combinations thereof. Here I have three, two input AND gates and a three input uh, OR gate. So quite a bit easier. Now this scenario comes up uh, quite a bit. So we might ask the question, what if you had this chip? And in lab tomorrow, you, you've got the, those common chips that we're going to use. I'm just going to be your stock boy. You'll tell me how many of so many you want. I'll go get them for you. Um, but let's say uh, that you knew about this one. So what if you had a uh, 7454? And what that one includes is something like this. And it mixes two inputs and three input AND gates. So you have a two input AND, and then you have a three input AND, and then a two input AND, and then a three input AND. And those all go into a OR. Or I guess I shouldn't say an OR, a NOR. Okay. So that's 7454. Now if you want to, if you, uh, just do a TTL, uh, search uh, Google TTL, transistor, transistor logic. We're running the TTL series, the uh, plus 5 volt uh, series. And there's, there's a lot of those. But that's, that's one. We're not necessarily going to use that tomorrow, but for our problem here, this might be a very handy one. You might say, well, it's not exactly like ours, but could we make it like that? And I think we could. So let's say that I take this chip and... Uh, Maybe I'll redraw it so I don't muddy up this picture quite as bad. Because if I can get away with just one chip package, then everything is in, inside there. We don't generate as much heat. We don't use as much power. It's a uh, better arrangement altogether. So let's see if I can make this work. Okay, so this is this is what's going on with the chip. Other than the uh, power and ground of the chip, those are the connections that I could make with the chip. So how do I hook that thing up? Well, it looks like I probably need to hook uh, the temperature to this one, right? Okay. And then we need pressure to both of these. So let me hook up pressure here. And I will hook up pressure to that one and that one okay and then what did I have this was uh, this was not L right so I've got L I'll put an inverter here so we're gonna have to buy an inverter we've got that then this last one what do I want I want to have the not L so I can have this one. And what else did I need? I needed uh, temperature on that thing, didn't I? So I'll go out here, come off the temperature. Like that. So far so good, right? Now I got some extra wires hanging around, extra parts. We don't want that. Um, I mean, one thing we, we noticed is, and I, I guess I didn't say anything about this. I mean, maybe I should have said this. Here's the weight. It just goes nowhere. So I could have the uh, weight here going nowhere. It doesn't do anything. But I got to deal with these wires. So let's see. This is an AND that has an extra lead on it. So how do I get, how, what should I do to this thing to make this so it doesn't affect it? 
If I put a 1 on it, will that work? I mean, if I leave a 0 on it, this thing's never going to activate, right? But if I put a 1 on it, then it goes back to be between these two inputs. So I think I can put a 1 on that thing. And then along those same lines, what could I do to these so that this uh, hopefully is a 0 here and doesn't affect this OR function? But what if I put a 0 on this or, or put it to ground? That would be the same thing. Wouldn't that always give me a zero out? Yeah, okay. And this is a nor, so I better put another inverter on here because I would like to have it uh, positive out, I guess. That should work, shouldn't it? Yeah, that's kind of nice. So we bought one chip, a 7454, and then we had to go with uh, what a 7404 is an inverter. So uh, there's what, four inverters on that chip, so with two chips, we got this done. Now we're going to have to hook up an LED here, so we'll probably put somewhere about 150 ohms. We'll have a resistor in here, and then we'll have this uh, LED. And this will then go to ground. Okay. So that should work. Now, if this is, uh, you know, some a big uh, tank of a uh, really nasty chemical, we probably want to do better than turning on a little LED that uh, maybe sits for years and gets dust on it. And uh, let's see, is that on or is that not on? Yes. Uh, I think that's just. I don't. I don't know that there. It's just a, a, along the numbers. It starts out at 7,400. Yeah. There's a, a a couple. I think there's a couple hundred numbers in the sequence. So we'll be using the lower numbers. 7400 is a NAND, right? You make everything from a NAND. That would turn tomorrow's lab, uh, make it pretty challenging, but you could do it. Lots of wires. Um, but I would, yeah, there's no way that I could look at this and say say what it is based on those numbers. I'd have to, I'd have to look up the pin diagram. Yeah. So if we look at these these chips, the, the problem is is the amount of uh, current that you could have here, right? Uh, if we look at that uh, current going through, that doesn't take very much current, uh, a few milliamps to light that LED. If I wanted to start to have uh, a, a buzzer, an audible alarm, or if I wanted to have a big light, or maybe I wanted to turn a pump on, uh, we need we're going to need more current, right? I mean, if I have a 500 horsepower pump, I'm not going to be able to run that much current through my uh, chip, right? Probably not. Okay, so let's talk about what we could do with that. So what we could do is we could come out of that thing. So I'll put, I won't reproduce the entire thing, but we'll say that we have an ore. And I'll just say it's an ore without an inverter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a uh, NPN transformer. I'm not a transformer, NPN transistor. Okay. And uh, those of you who go into electrical spend a lot of time next year talking about transistors. But uh, what this transistor will allow us to do is that if I have a uh, small current going through here, it will allow me to control a much larger current going through here. So maybe I better put a resistor on this, and then I could have um, some very large load here. And maybe I'll put a, a voltage source here and have that go to ground. So the, the nice thing about this uh, transistor is with a very small current here, maybe I'll try and do this graphically, that little small current there, it allows you to control a much larger current this way. So what could we put in for that uh, load? Well, you could have a great big light in there if you wanted to. It'll really start to shine, or you could put in some sort of a buzzer or speaker or claxton horn or something. Or you could go to the next step. We're probably still not going to get enough current to run a, um, a great big pump. So we could uh, maybe have this 
go around a uh, core, okay, like that, and then we'd have this uh, mag switch or a relay, so we'd have a wire coming from there, and then we'd have a contact here and another wire. You put a great big source here, and then you can put your uh, motor in here. Okay, and you could actually line three of these up together and have this one uh, one meg switch controlling three different phases, and actually start a three phase pump with this. Okay. So that's probably what you're going to have going on. So. Uh, those of you, like I said, going into electrical, you'll spend a lot of time talking about this. How can we do that? How can we control that? The other thing maybe we should talk a little bit about is this end over here. What's going on with the temperature or the pressure or the level? So how could we, uh, how could we get some of those sensors? Maybe we'll do temperature first. So this is the... Um, uh, Instrumentation folks, people that go into instrumentation, how can we uh, instrument something for temperature? What would be a good way? Well, what if we just use the uh, old uh, bimetal like uh, dumb old thermostat like thing? So, what we do is we take a bimetal, some, some two pieces of metal that are bonded together, and they have different coefficients of thermal expansion, right? Like aluminum expands about three times uh, more than steel for each uh, change in, in degree in, in temperature. So maybe we would put uh, uh, aluminum here and uh, steel here. And if I have some uh, delta T that increases, what would we expect this thing to look like? It's going to start to curve down, isn't it? Uh, no, it's going to curve up. The steel is not going to curve as much as the aluminum. So you're going to have something that uh, curves up. So you could put a contact over here, right? You could have a, a set of contacts there, and it's going to uh, push up and make contact with that. Yeah, usually it's not very much. A lot of times they'll they'll exacerbate this by uh, coiling this up. If you put it in a coil, it'll it be more extreme. So just a plain old uh, bimetal is is very common, used in a lot of thermostats. It's cheap. What'll be another way? Okay, digital. How do we do it with digital? Because I'm thinking this is digital, right? I mean, if I look between these, it's either on or off, isn't it? Yeah. If if I wanted to if I wanted to think about analog, we could actually go with a, a piece of material and maybe monitor the uh, the resistance of it. Does the resistance change with temperature? Yeah, it does. Uh, probably if you, if you look at the uh, temperature gauge in your automobile, that's probably a uh, resistor in there that's monitoring that. The res, the temperature changes, the resistance changes, and that gives you an analog. Um, the reason I like this is because it gave me actually a digital signal. It was on or off. Now, could we take this analog and process it? Yeah, we certainly could. Okay. So there's a few things about temperature. We certainly have not exhausted that. Um, what was the other one we had? Pressure. How could we do this for pressure? Uh, well, uh, that'd probably be one and the same. So we've got this uh, chamber of this thing in here and we want to you've got a port on this okay so we could uh, yeah I mean one way with a uh, pressure gauge is uh, you use a you could use a board and tube gauge so they take this tube and they coil it up like this and have you ever seen those uh, uh, little party things that you blow into and they unwind exactly the same thing here as you put pressure into this this tries to uh, straighten out and unwind and if you hook a um, you could hook a needle to this and have a uh, pressure gauge 
Now we want to try and have this so it's done electronically, so you could hook a potentiometer to this thing, right? You could have this thing go to the uh, the uh, pointer on a potentiometer. And as this uh, moves, that's going to move back and forth on that potentiometer. So that'd be one way of doing it. Wouldn't be very efficient to have a gauge and have to hire someone to, to uh, watch the gauge and type it in, right? Okay. Um, what are other ways to do this? This is a little bit, uh, we don't do that that much. There's probably better ways of doing it. Remember the uh, concept of a strain gauge where we, uh, where we had some uh, wire, we maybe hooked it to something, and it, we had this very thin wire that went back and forth, and this was probably attached to something. And as we put uh, tension or compression on this, we'll say that we put tension, these wires got longer and they got smaller in cross-section, right? And we say that resistance is equal to the resistivity rho. It shouldn't change unless we change the temperature, but we Temperature is oftentimes changing, so we do have to do temperature compensation. So the resistance times the length divided by the cross-sectional area, right? So as the length gets longer and the cross-sectional area gets smaller, the resistance changes, doesn't it? Okay. So we could use this strain gauge principle. What if we took and we put a, a, a piece of pipe here and we put this diaphragm in it and we put a strain gauge on this thing? As we introduce pressure to this thing, what does that diaphragm do? Might bulge, right? And what's going to happen to the strain gauge? Those wires are going to get longer, aren't they? So the resistance would change. That's uh, fairly common. Probably not as common as, as the, the one that I might show you here, which is we call a capacitance manometer. So let's do the same thing. Let's put this diaphragm in here and let's put a couple of uh, leads here. And as I put pressure in here, what happens? This comes over and it gets closer to those leads, doesn't it? As that gets closer to the leads, does it change the capacitance between those two probes? It does. Okay. And the nice thing about this is it's uh, very responsive, it's very quick, it's uh, very rugged, um, so, and it's, it's fairly inexpensive. Because a lot of the, I mean, those are some things that we're thinking about. I mean, how much time does it take for this to happen? This resistor here is really slow. Oops. This resistance here, that, that takes a long time for that to change. This is going to be very quick. Um, how uh, rugged it is, okay. Is it, uh, is it very fragile or is it uh, going to survive out in an environment like that where we have different chemicals and whatnot? Um, and also then a, a big deal is, of course, cost, initial cost, maintenance costs, things like that. So, so we did, uh, oh, we got a good, a good idea with pressure. What's the uh, next one? Level. How could we do level? Well, since we're talking about capacitance, what if I put a couple of leads in here? And between these leads, again, I ask the question, what's the capacitance? When the fluid's up here, I have a different dielectric than if the fluid is up there, right? Is the capacitance going to change? Absolutely. We could also do it probably like your uh, fuel tank in your automobile. We could... Just have the classic toilet float here, and the uh, toilet float is going to a potentiometer, right? Okay. Both of these are going to be more analog, so we're going to have to uh, condition that signal to turn it into a digital signal. I guess that's why a lot of you will get to make money with uh, analog to digital conversion. So we got a good handle on level. I guess we might finish up with uh, weight. How could we do weight? Well, we don't need to. That's true. In our example, we don't need to, but I guess for completeness sake, maybe we'll talk about it. So let's say we got this thing, and we want to figure out the weight of it. Oh, I mean, we could prop up this side on some fixed point and then put this on a cantilever. And 
We could put our strain gauge on here, right? And eventually turn that strain into a measure of weight. Okay. A lot of garbage trucks have strain gauges on their frame because you can imagine uh, you're picking up uh, wet leaves in the fall. You get that truck pretty heavy fast, right? Dry grass clippings in the summer, you could make the same number of stops and only have a fraction of the weight, right? So you may want to know how much is on your truck because, I mean, you're going to be the one that gets the ticket if you're uh, overloaded. So a lot of times they have onboard scales. Another good one for onboard scales is log trucks, um, the uh, amount of weight that you have with logs. Gravel is, is, is fairly homogeneous. You know pretty well uh, loading out, uh, you know, how many yards it is going to be. So usually you don't see it so much on that. But things that can vary a lot in uh, density, moisture content, and things like that, oftentimes they'll have onboard scales. And strain gauge is a great way to do it. Put your strain gauges on your frame or your axles. You, you calibrate it, and you're, you're off and running. They, uh, they used to do this a lot with, uh, with pressure. So you could just uh, take this. Again, you probably fix one side of this, and you could put some sort of a pressure bladder under here. I mean, an airbag. Same airbags they put in their low riders to make them go up and down. And as we add weight to this thing, what's it going to do to the pressure of that? Pressure is going to go up, so I could essentially monitor it with a, a pressure gauge once I got it calibrated. So then I guess we'd have to go back to this thing, wouldn't we? If we want to do this electronically and figure out how we can get uh, pressure to do that. So a few things. This is certainly not exhaustive. Uh, those of you going to instrumentation will, will spend an entire term at least talking about these and, and a few weeks on each one of these and the phenomena that's, that's involved with them. Questions with that? that, awesome. that capacitance phenomena? Mm -hmm. Capacitance phenomena. Yeah, and the cool thing about this is you could have pressure in either side uh, or, and, and measure differential pressure. Yes? Well, this uh, diaphragm here, let's say that this pressure here is greater, so it's going to cause that the pressure here is greater than the pressure over here. If this is high pressure and this is atmosphere, then we'd expect this diaphragm to move over, and that's going to uh, then effectively cause these two probes to interact differently, and in fact, they will have more capacitance between them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you could you could have a great big spring and uh, have your capacitors uh, a great big spring separating your capacitor. Yeah. So again, when you when you think about going through this, you want something that it, uh, again is going to meet your time criteria. If you have to make this measurement in a fraction of a second correct, it's going to have to be able to to do this very quickly. You want something that you're not always having to recalibrate and mess with. You want something that's 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 cheap too. So, Being fairly inexpensive. You can get them less than a hundred bucks a piece, so. which is not bad when you start looking at stuff like this. You can get a lot of money into stuff like this. Uh, a, a capacitance manometer is a good way to measure pressure in a lot of different things. I mean, the other thing that you have to uh, look at here is what if or Murphy's Law. You know, if this diaphragm were to rupture, are we going to cause an explosion or something like that? That's some things that we have to, uh, to think about also. That's why they're going to pay you the big bucks. Well, we have, uh, I guess we're getting close to a fairly decent stopping point for today. We're a little bit early, but uh, we have one uh, section left, which is code conversion. So we're going to talk about how can we convert from a, a base 10 number to a base 2 number or a base 2 number back to a base 2 number so that we can put information in and get information out. So we'll talk about that. That'll go along with laboratory number uh, 7. Uh, so when we get together next time, we will do that. That will finish up our digital, which will be good, because a week from today we have the exam, right? So I think that's it.